Uh, next up, we have the Iowa City Community School District. Uh, I am Sean Eystone. Uh, Char uh, Charlie Eastham. Lisa Williams. Rufina Malone. All right, anybody from uh, Clear Creek School District here? Uh, how about folks from the university? All right, that's all the ones that are on the list. And I'm kind of looking at people's backgrounds and I think maybe we're missing some. So is anybody else wants to jump in and introduce themselves and tell us where you're I'll jump in, Cami from Solon, fresh off Solon Beef Days. Good afternoon. Welcome. Trying to look at all the little pictures and see how many folks got to say hi. Most everyone said hi. Chris Taylor here from Swisher. There he is. Oh, see, not everybody fits on one screen anymore. There's so many of us. I like it. All right, I uh, appreciate that. Um, welcome everyone. Um, we do have a, a fair number of things and I'd like to try and hold us to our time. So let's get right into it. Um, the first item uh, we have is an update on our facilities extra plan. And so I will pass that off to uh, Superintendent Degner. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you're well and good to see you all. Um, yes, I did wanna take a minute and update you guys on the work that we've been engaged in in the district here around preparing for our second facility master plan. One thing we've been proud of uh, in the district as we went through the first facility master plan uh, was that it was, um, we, we used the phrase on time and on budget as we started the plan and, and really we ended up under budget and under the amount of time we allotted. And so that was a real uh, positive for us with the, the first facility uh, master plan and all the projects that we took on. I think people are pretty familiar with that process, uh, but we've been engaged in a lot of work here uh, since February. As you can note on this timeline, we started these conversations about preparing uh, for the second uh, facility master plan. And so I just kind of show you that timeline to see uh, some of the steps we've taken uh, as we're now here in, in late July, uh, all the way back to February. Uh, you'll notice on there is the portrait of the graduate sessions that was a, a piece for us that we engaged with in the district uh, to talk about what competencies and skills we want our students to leave. PK-12 ed with, and, and people may say, well, I thought that's what your standards were that were set from the state. And that's correct too, that we do have those curriculum standards. Um, this I like to describe to people more as what, what are the other skills uh, that we also think are gonna be absolutely necessary or how do we um, maybe dig a little deeper on those curriculum standards and know that, that students are gonna need to have a good handle on those. And so the second facility master plan, like you can see, then as you get to uh, the time frame where it now talks about community information sessions. So that's a piece I wanted to make sure uh, you guys understood as well that we were engaged with currently as we go through this work. Um, but the other thing I want to start with before I talk about those key engagement sessions is just a, a real quick overview uh, of some of the conversations we've had that are guiding this work. And that would be our um, school board guiding principles. And so these are important for us to consider in a sec second facility master plan because the first facility master plan addressed a lot of needs in our buildings. One that was frequently talked about was air conditioning. And so some of those basic needs uh, that we had to start to get identified and rectified throughout the district. Uh, some of the shift uh, in the second facility master plan, while well, obviously we still have uh, some, some needs in our buildings and space um, concerns as we continue to grow as a district, are also what we do with those learning spaces. And that connects to the portrait of the graduate competencies that you see at the very top, adaptability, communication, critical thinking, empathy, global citizens and learners mindset, down to what the board established as their guiding principles as we take on this work around ensuring equity and inclusion, growing early learning, increasing student opportunity through school design and supporting the whole child. So the board went through a series of conversations through the operations committee to, to develop those and then engagement with the whole board around some of the principles that would um, drive that work. Uh, in our first facility master plan, you remember it was, it was a long list of projects and we are of course going to work to identify actual projects and specific needs, 
Uh, but part of the work in identifying those projects this time has to be rooted in what learning looks like and, and how we're going to outfit those spaces for the learning opportunities we want to provide for our students. If I go back um, just one page here, and I'm trying to be a little bit brief in some of my comments, you see the community engagement sessions we have uh, outlined here for the summer. And those community engagement sessions are important uh, because the, below the board's guiding principles, we're trying to establish this, the community's priorities for how that plan should be informed and things that are important to the community. Because in the fall, um, we are going to ask uh, the community to support extending two levies that the district already has, uh, the PEPL and save or revenue purpose statement. Uh, and those are just extensions of current levies that go in. So there's no new money ask uh, that we're making to the community in that way. There's no general obligation bond the district's going out for the second time. No new tax we're asking anybody to support. It's really an extension of two funding streams that already come into the school district that districts have to renew after a period of time. Uh, that will allow us to then borrow against some of those dollars long term to fund these facility master projects in, in FMP 2.0. So you can see that we've already began that work. Uh, July 6th was our first community engagement session. And then we have another one tomorrow evening. Uh, so if you don't have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow night, we'd love to see you come out and provide some input uh, to inform this plan. These are all being held virtually. Uh, so continue and engage the community that way. Uh, and then you can see the, the three that follow that as well. There'd be another opportunity over lunchtime on Thursday. If that works better in people's schedule, we tried to do a couple lunchtime opportunities along with an evening one again on Tuesday, August 3rd, and that final lunchtime opportunity on Thursday, August 5th. And so if you are looking for more information or if we could ask you to show, share more information with your uh, constituents out in the community, uh, this FMP 2.0 landing page uh, for the school district is a great uh, resource to go on. It's got some historical information around the geo bond in 2017, the work of FMP 1.0, and then the work I outlined here for you to today with FMP 2.0. But um, I think the, the biggest piece of understanding um, for folks to understand is that we're not asking for um, new dollars in that way. It's really an extension of those two funding streams that we have coming in. And those funding streams also fund other components for us in the district uh, that are necessary for us to continue our operations. Uh, you might have heard us talk about them or you guys talk about in your um, spheres of influence, those life cycles, uh, those are funded through those PEPL dollars for us. And, and of course, the save or the revenue purpose statement, like I said. So uh, there's a broad breadth of what those uh, revenue streams fund uh, for us, but they definitely do fund our, our facility plans and our ability to keep growing and improving those uh, facilities as we move forward. So I might ask um, anybody from our team, if I, if I left a component out there, you'll see a subset that uh, talks about preschool. You notice that one of our uh, guiding principles was growing early learning from the board and we've had a work session around goal alignment around preschool and how to grow preschool opportunities uh, for the school district. Uh, unfortunately, the state doesn't uh, fund full day preschool models for us. Uh, transportation and wraparound care become funding concerns if we're serious about growing that and, and trying to extend our opportunities outside of the uh, half day model that we're able to provide right now that you know works for a segment of families, but not for uh, several other families. And so early learning is a, a definite consideration uh, for us and how we grow that. And then uh, some conversations uh, that we would like to continue around funding streams that can support that work. So there I gave some maybe think time to my uh, board members to see if they had anything they wanted to add to, to what I provided there tonight or Sean, anything you want to uh, throw in. But we wanted to give you that uh, brief overview this evening so you were informed about that progress. Thanks, Matt. I mean, I think you did a good job uh, summarizing it. We do have uh, a couple of members of our, um, our committee, so they can maybe jump in if there's anything to add to that. But I, I think uh, certainly willing to hear some questions if uh, folks have any. No questions means you did a great job, Matt. All right. I'll take it. Thanks. Let's go ahead and move on. We do have quite a few things. So uh, our next item is uh, a discussing potential partnerships to conduct a follow-up study of the 2005, I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, Johnson <laughs> County. 
turn it over to whoever from the county wants to read everything instead of me doing it. So, hi, this is Josh Boussard and Rod or any other supervisor, did you want to uh, say anything before I jumped in? I have about seven slides I was hoping to show. Go for it, Josh. I'm going right. to go for it then. Great. All right, let's see if this works. Oops, I got to do share screen here. All right, how does that look? Is that the slides or notes? Like slides. All right, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. So thank you for uh, uh, letting me uh, talk for a few minutes tonight. And uh, I've got to get my bearings here on this. Okay, so, uh, and of course, the little bar is going to block everything I want to see. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, so this agenda item is discuss the potential partnerships to conduct a follow-up study in the 2005 hydrology and simulation of groundwater flow in the Silurian Devonian Aquifer System, uh, Joss County, Iowa, to be completed by the USGS Central Midwest Water Science Center. Um, so in essence, we this is a study of a groundwater flow. Are we going to have enough groundwater to uh, support our current and future needs? And I guess just some introductions. My name is Josh Bussard. Uh, I'm the director of the Johnson County Planning, Development, and Sustainability Department. Uh, I was asked here by the County Board of Supervisors. I also have James Lucina. Uh, James leads the Public uh, Health Department's Environmental Division. And I believe I also have uh, John Nania from the uh, United States Geological Survey. John, he's the uh, acting center director for the USGS, the Central Midwest Water Science Center, and John may have some of his team in attendance as well. And uh, the whole point of this agenda item is uh, to inquire about developing partnerships to fund a follow-on study of the 2005 water study, uh, the, the water study that was completed in 2005. So, uh, a little bit about the study. So the O5 study, it studied the Silurian Aquifer, which is the primary uh, source of groundwater for Johnson County's unincorporated areas, and I believe some of the municipalities. And the study was a, uh, as a quantitative assessment of the groundwater availability through 2025. And it was essentially, it was modeled on the inflows and the outflows of the waters of the aquifer. Uh, in essence, what, what you call the, the recharge rate. I wanna make it clear that this is a quantitative assessment, not a qualitative assessment. Uh, we are by no means looking at the quality of the groundwater. And the study was completed through a car share partnership uh, that consisted of Johnson County, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty, and Solon, as well as the uh, University of Iowa. And essentially, uh, the USGS constructed a groundwater flow model um, as a, uh, uh, to serve as a management tool, I guess you might call it, a management tool to uh, help regulatory agencies such as ourselves meet the uh, water needs uh, for future development. So uh, the Previous study, uh, it was helpful and it was informative, uh, but it only uh, modeled groundwater flow up through 2025. So we are quickly uh, approaching a uh, quarter decade or, or quarter century. Uh, there are, and I think that there are a couple of routes that uh, could possibly be taken should the county and any of its departments decide to do so. Uh, the existing model, uh, which is already created, it can be used again uh, to project on for a, another time horizon, let's say 2025 to 2050, or we can have a new and improved model to answer both new and existing questions. Um, and I think the real difference is, is going to be cost and time. So using the existing model, it's going to cost the least, 
um, and using the new model that is going to take a little bit longer to create and is also going to cost more. However, let's not sort of be uh, uh, penny wise and pound foolish because we all know that having knowledge is priceless and that the more we know today, that's going to help us tomorrow. And that is essentially, as effectively, it's going to save us money in the long road. So uh, I don't have an exact estimate. If John from the USGS is here, he can probably help us a little better. Uh, but in 2005, uh, the cost, it was a 50-50 cost share of $350,000. So the entities paid $175,000, and I believe the USGS, uh, through a, a federal grant, matched that $175,000 for the total of $350,000. Um, and here's a little bit more on the existing model. If any uh, Johnson County or any of its partners would decide to go that route, so the existing model uh, will be able to answer. Uh, the, the current groundwater supply, if it's adequate, based on our current or any increased development trends. Uh, the existing model, it will also help us uh, determine if what effects uh, a long lasting uh, drought might have on the aquifer. So the improved model, uh, well, uh, like, like I said, it's going to be more expensive to create. It's gonna take a little longer um, however, is going to also allow us to answer some other questions uh, in addition to what we can answer with the existing model. So an approved model uh, might uh, also give us greater insight as to how development and water conservation efforts um, are going to affect the water supply. Uh, it'll give us some insights into climate change. Um, it's also going to give us some insights if we have another large water user all of a sudden come to the area such as a quarry or possibly what would happen if a large water user, a water user was to uh, go off, go offline. And a few other reasons why a uh, improved model might be important. It'll help us uh, educate the public. It'll help us with uh, water conservation efforts. And then if it comes to a finding any new and developing any new water uh, resources. So I guess as we wrap up, um, I think that the Board of Supervisors is interested in knowing if any entity uh, would like to partner to cost share. Um, and I also believe John from the USGS and his team is also here. Um, they're going to be the best source of answers to any of your questions. And uh, John and his team, they can also help us to determine uh, what the next steps to a uh, uh, a potential proposal might be. Um, with that, uh, let's see. Have any questions? That's all I have. And uh, James Lucina from Public Health. Is there anything that you wanted to add? No, Josh. I think you covered it pretty well. I uh, appreciate that. Just if there's uh, questions or discussion to be had, um, maybe John from USGS would be able to help us as well. Uh, I, this is Jude Thomas from USGS. Uh, I was just going to say, we're having a little bit of trouble. I, can everyone hear me? Yep. Thank you for nodding. Um, we're having a little trouble. The, the rest of John is unable to join us via video or sound, but he's on the call watching. And then uh, we also have Eddie Hodge uh, with us, who's a groundwater modeler. And I'm, I'm Jude Thomas, like I said, USGS with the Central Midwest Water Science Center. So um, I can help uh, with the questions. Um, and I'm uh, head of groundwater and geophysics. Okay, and this is John Manny. I was just uh, just given access to be able to talk. Nice, John. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that was a that was a great introduction, uh, Josh and James. Yeah, we'd be happy to answer any questions. But we've got some technical experts here with Jude and Eddie Hodge that could uh, could help out if there's any questions. But uh, it was a good good overview from Josh. I'll throw it out there to the various entities. I don't know if uh, Rod or somebody else from the county want to lead off a discussion, or are you looking for specific answers from the different municipalities? Well, I, yeah, I can talk for a second, uh, Sean, if that's all right. Um, I had been approached by some folks uh, 
in the development business who had been asked about this and they said, you know, well, don't you folks have a study? And of course uh, there is a study, but as, as Josh uh, reported, it's just about over. Um, and it was kind of interesting. It gave me an opportunity to go back and look at what the USGS had done in 2005. And it was pretty remarkably accurate in terms of the stuff they uh, projected and predicted. And so um, it seems to me that it makes some sense as we all move forward the next 25 years to have um, the same type of information available uh, uh, to us as decision makers and to the public. So uh, we just, we knew it would take them a while to get this done if we wanted to do it. And so we wanted to get it out there. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. This is uh, Mayor John from Coralville. Um, certainly, I think this makes all the sense in the world since we're nearing the end of the study of the, the previous study. And, um, you know, I'll, I'm far from any expertise in this area. So I'll defer to the staff and the engineers, et cetera, about exactly what the next model should include. But I think um, I feel comfortable saying that Coralville would be supportive of being a participant again in this study. And it's probably time we get started. For the city of Iowa City as Mayor Bruce Teague, and I think um, we would certainly want to run this by staff to see um, of their interest. And so what I would um, uh, probably suggest is that the county connect with our city manager's office to maybe start the initial conversations. This is Chris, I'll chime in from North Liberty. I'll, I'll say the same thing that Mayor Teague just said. I think this is a great idea. Uh, that our staffs uh, should be able to explore and pick up on what was useful from that last study and what they'd like to see in this next one. And I'll jump in from Sol and uh, I can't see any reason why the city council would not want to participate again, especially with the growth we're experiencing in the area. Um, and we are working on a joint meeting with the board here coming up in the next few weeks. And I'm sure that will be one of the topics we discuss. This is Doug from Tiffin, and I'll echo what everyone else has already said. I, I think we would be a willing participant at least to uh, take a look at this and what it would mean. Um, so yeah, just uh, keep in contact with all of us. This is Janice from Iowa City. I would just add that, that it seems to me that as we look at this that, and, and climate change in addition to growth is, is what, whatever we can learn from this, assuming that it goes forward would really be incredibly important. Any other? Questions or comments from anyone before we move on? I'm trying to stay off mic as much as possible because apparently the people putting my new roof on have ended their break <laughs> right about now. So it's getting a little loud here. Um, if there are no further questions or comments, I want to thank the group for uh, the presentation. And it sounds like uh, the different uh, entities have some Next steps, uh, communication uh, between them, and uh, communication is always key. So let's go ahead and move on, unless there's any last second thoughts on that one. All right, moving on. Uh, thank, uh, the next item up is also from Dutch County and a COVID 19 update. And I don't know who wants to lead off with that. Looks like Sam. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as always, appreciate the time to provide updates on our community's COVID-19 response. Uh, I'll cover the disease side of um, investigations and where we're at, and then cover vaccinations uh, as well, and um, provide the updates uh, from that end. Uh, in terms of our investigations, we are still within seeing single digits of cases uh, every day, a few sporadic um, kind of peaks, uh, nothing uh, in double digits really. Um, uh, that note any kind of concern, but uh, as time has gone on, uh, we have seen a, a very small steady increase and likely 
um, you know, as everyone is aware, um, the Delta variant, which is known to be uh, slightly more contagious, uh, is the dominant strain in the U.S., likely in Iowa as well. So uh, we continue to be um, watchful on uh, any other activities um, that concern variants uh, and, and diving into our disease investigations on that front. Um, it's still younger persons, uh, primarily, um, that we're seeing in terms of cases. Uh, the age range does span from as young as one to, to 60 plus. Uh, so it, it is folks of, of all ages, but um, as we've noted, our average age range is still younger. Um, noting that specifically because again, our vaccination rates in our 60, 70 and 80 plus um, decade ranges, um, our vaccination rates are high 80s, low 90s. Uh, so good progress there for vaccination, which is good news. So. Um, noting all of that because that uh, that makes sense. That it's a picture that we can understand. Um, as some have probably seen or noted uh, from the state health department, they no longer require investigations uh, for COVID-19 as of July 1st. Uh, Johnson County Public Health has continued and will continue to perform those investigations. Uh, we will continue to contact trace and in terms of capacity, uh, roughly at one point we had a 48 to 50 person contact tracing team uh, Many have graduated and moved on, so we bid them adieu and thank them for all their help and effort. We're excited to see them move on to other uh, uh, jobs and positions that they've sought out post-graduating, uh, but uh, we'll still maintain a capacity of about roughly 20 contact tracers. So in terms of next steps and going into the fall and winter, uh, we'll continue to maintain that capacity. Uh, and right now, currently, they're dual hatting uh, COVID-19 investigations and working on vaccine promotion with us as well. Uh, so we've worked on other internal trainings to help with vaccine competence and, and addressing those questions while they're on those investigations. Uh, roughly, uh, we're at a 2% positivity rate for the county. Um, if persons are watching the, the state's dashboard, there are some other counties with lower vaccination rates with their positivity rate increasing. So again, things that match up with what we know uh, with lower vaccination rates, it's expected to see uh, those disease investigations uh, potentially increase. Uh, as time goes on. Um, in terms of uh, vaccines, again, we are the highest vaccinated uh, county in the state. Uh, so kudos to everyone and a huge thanks to our community for recognizing that importance to get vaccinated. Our total population vaccination rate is roughly about 58, close to 59%. Uh, so again, we're leading the state with, I believe, Dubuque County uh, following a, a second uh, in the uh, low 50s. So. Um, we're making great progress. Uh, we would love to see that higher though, obviously, 80, 90. Uh, the ideal 100% would be wonderful to achieve, but we know that some things are just um, uh, you know, not possible, but we will continue to make uh, progress as, as much as we can. Uh, I think uh, previously we reported April, May that we started to see vaccinations decrease. Uh, since then, uh, May and June, we were having roughly about 30 uh, new vaccinations a day, we've seen a small uh, increase up to about 40, uh, 40 a day in, in July. Um, more than likely, due to the concerns and, and news of the Delta variant uh, increasing, uh, that's um, dominated the news in terms of COVID updates, uh, that and that um, hospitalizations and deaths are due to or, or um, primarily unvaccinated persons. Uh, the other side of that is that uh, Folks that are in the wait and see category have likely seen a lot of their friends and family vaccinated. Uh, and so we note this because it's uh, just as important now as it was before uh, to continue to share those stories and those experiences uh, with folks who uh, still have questions, concerns, uh, maybe even drag them uh, along to the pharmacy or their doctor's office. Maybe they need that moral support. Uh, so again, uh, we continue to see a small increase of vaccinations across the community. And likely a lot of our uh, or a lot of our operations have shifted to vaccine promotion. And so we've tried to think creatively on how to address uh, our younger population where we have uh, lower rates of vaccination, uh, traditionally that college age uh, kind of population, uh, then certainly others. We know that um, taking time off work is not always possible or easy to do. And so uh, promoting um, uh, to employers uh, being able to take that time off for uh, making the vaccine appointment or making vaccine clinics available on site. So uh, we continue a lot of efforts on that front. Um, even creatively enough, we are looking at 
uh, providing needle fear kits. We had our contact tracing team deliver those today at pharmacies and providers. Uh, there are some uh, interesting and creative ways to try to, uh, we'll say, distract persons from uh, their uh, vaccine administration. So we've uh, sent out uh, some of the, those techniques and tools to use. Some of it is cold spray, um, certainly to try to ease the fear and concern of pain. And then um, little, uh, they call them buzzies. Uh, they vibrate in their cold pack. And so it's um, proven and evidence-based uh, to help with uh, injection site pain. So uh, as always, any uh, other suggestions or comments on how we can provide or promote vaccines, we'll gladly take them. Uh, we're doing everything we can to continue to promote vaccinations and how important they are, how safe and effective they are, um, despite the, the news and misinformation that, that um, does dominate the news at times. So uh, with that, uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sam. Anybody have any questions for Sam? All right. Like I told Matt, if nobody has questions, that must mean you did it right. Okay. Any last minute before we move on? All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next item. Thanks again, Sam. Uh, our next item is from the city of Iowa City. Um, a review of fireworks policies from the various cities in the county. Hello, everyone. I am going to uh, momentarily ask that Councillor John Thomas of Iowa City kind of jump in on this. Um, but as we all know, the 4th of July um, is a time where it is very challenging uh, in the communities where fireworks are being sent off when it is actually going against some city codes. Um, and we also know that the sale of fireworks can take place in our communities. And some of those items that are being sold are illegal. And so if Councillor Thomas is here, I'll let him kind of lead us in this discussion. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. I had, um, you know, with roughly two weeks or so ago, we had uh, the 4th of July and the days prior to the 4th of July, where we did see fireworks uh, being used uh, in Iowa City. I'm sure they were used in cities and county in, in, as a whole. Um, and, you know, afterwards I was hearing and reading on social media how, you know, things had gone in particular neighborhoods. And, um, you know, it just seemed to me, I, being someone who's always interested in, in how other cities and public entities are addressing questions such as this. Uh, I thought it might be an opportunity to use this meeting to try to understand that a little bit better. Uh, we had a report in a memo from our police chief and fire chief uh, regarding uh, their responses for calls for service this particular year, 2021. And the, the calls for service are down. Um, there was one firework citation issued this year in Iowa City and 12 verbal warnings. And what was also noted was for most calls, officers were unable to, to locate the individuals using the fireworks, uh, which in conversations I've had with at least the neighbors where I live, uh, you know, the fireworks were often being, and these are, these are major fireworks, not firecrackers, uh, you know, where I could see the fireworks, uh, say in North Market Square from my house a quarter mile away. Uh, I, I, was, I was surprised to hear that, 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 it was un, that officers were unable to locate uh, the source of the fireworks and, and, and the individuals. So I, I thought it might again be useful to hear uh, from other cities and the county in terms of how things went uh, this 4th of July for them. And if there's, if in my mind, if there were any way to try to come up with a kind of uh, consistent policy, uh, that's, that might be useful too, because, um, you know, if, if there's sort of a weak link in the system, if we find that there's one particular place where enforcement is lax uh, compared to other, other cities or towns, um, that may be a place where people realize they can 
fire away if, if they choose. So anyway, those were my thoughts going into it. I think um, you know some of the ways this might be framed would be: uh, are is there a particular time when we might, for example, go from verbal warnings to citations? Uh, one of the issues that came up was just how ongoing the fireworks were. It was well beyond 10 p.m. Um, and I think part of the concern I was hearing was that it just seemed unrelenting. Um, do, do other cities consider, you know, kind of putting a limit to when warnings are issued and, and move more into an enforcement mode? Um, also, the fact that there's so many fireworks being being used now, it's not just small scale firecrackers, but um, I would almost call commercial grade fireworks. So anyway, I just, I was very interested in, in hearing from other, other places as to how, um, how they, what their policies are and how things went for them this year. Well, um, you know, it's difficult for all of us because uh, due to the state government, we are very restricted in making them illegal to sell. Um, but we, in Coralville, we had some success over the past year through a change in our ordinance of, of where they're allowed to be sold. Previously, it was in um, commercial or industrial zones, and we reduced that down to only being allowed to sell in industrial zones, which happens to be in Coralville, a very limited amount of space and not uh, it, it nearly as visible to the public as uh, commercial retail space might be. For instance, for the previous years, there had always been a huge tent on First Avenue across the street from the Iowa River Power Company restaurant. And it was just kind of a, a real irritant that they were selling all these fireworks out of this huge tent that were illegal to be discharged in the city. Uh, well, they weren't allowed to do that this year. So um, I don't have any numbers to quote. I just have anecdotal comments from the police department. Um, I, uh, that they were also down in Coralville this year, and they thought largely because of the restrictions we placed on the sale. But I know I've heard from other counselors and other public, that doesn't mean they didn't exist. There were a lot of fireworks, illegal fireworks still going off in our city. And it's just, it's such a difficult position for law enforcement because if, unless they really see the perpetrator lighting the fuse and setting them off, highly unlikely there would ever be a conviction in, by a judge in court because they're just, just, unless your neighbor wants to, you know, swear under oath that 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 he saw his he or she saw their neighbor shoot him off. It's very difficult to get a conviction. So um, it's just something that's it's very frustrating. We just keep working on it, but be happy to hear other folks' thoughts as well. Thanks. Hey, Sean, uh, Brad Kunkel has his hand raised, and maybe the sheriff would have something to contribute to this in the uh, attendees section. Anybody interested in hearing from the sheriff? There, am I in the meeting now? Yes. All right, perfect. I didn't, I'm joining late. I didn't know this was even going on until this afternoon or sometime today when I saw this was on the agenda. So I thought I would jump on. So obviously we're in a unique position out in the county because we have to navigate not only the calls in rural Johnson County, but all the small towns. Um, and Marilyn Dell kind of pointed out the frustration, for lack of a better term, I guess, that we run into and how we enforce this because we run into a couple of things. One, somewhat of an inconsistency. Two, the widespread availability, which makes everybody think, you know, they can do whatever they want with them. And then three, it often comes down to did we see somebody shooting that firework off at the time? Who are we going to write that ticket to? And then having to prioritize that and how we handle calls. Because on the 4th of July, fireworks calls are probably the lowest priority call that we have, right? I mean, everything else is going on at the same time. There are everything from loud parties to the amount of traffic, crashes, fights, and everything else. And then also managing fireworks complaints. Um, my guess would be in Iowa City that the reason you're seeing the majority of those calls being handled by a verbal warning, it's a matter of just handling the call and moving on. Most of the time that verbal warning will take care of that, telling somebody to knock it off typically takes care of it. Um, 
And it's that rare instance where you go back and, and write somebody the ticket, probably because either it's an ongoing problem or sometimes people just talk themselves into a ticket. You know what I mean? The other thing you got to think about in the small towns is if you're writing that ticket that is, is in violation of a city ordinance, then you're also the one now going to have to prosecute that. So it's going to be your city attorney prosecuting it and not the county attorney. And you, I think as cities, you just need to think about the, the, of the amount of money you're going to invest in prosecuting it. If, if you're going to have the fine be a hundred dollars, you're probably going to see a lot of people contest that ticket and you're going to be spending a considerable lot of money paying your city attorney to fight that in magistrate court. So it's, it's just something else to think about. Um, I, the, the confusion we run into again is just how different municipalities in the county handle it. And that's really kind of a mess that has been created and dumped on all of you because of how when the state enacted this law, they left it up to everybody to decide how to best handle it when the reality is, in my opinion, nothing was wrong until they legalize it and then created this problem we're all not having to deal with. Um, it, it, it's just a very challenging thing to navigate. I think in Solon this year, we had, I believe only five actual complaints reported to us. And I think in Tiffin, I wanna say eight were the number of, of calls that were reported over 4th of July weekend. That's just the complaints that came in to dispatch. As you all have probably seen the, the social media complaints are probably greater than they've ever been. Um, people were really, really frustrated with the amount of fireworks that went off in their towns, next door, in the streets, wherever it was over that weekend. And I'm still hearing stories about people cleaning firework debris out of their gutters um, from, from over the weekend. So um, we, we, we deal with it on all sides, but just know that for your law enforcement agencies, these are probably like I said, low priority calls, and they still wind up being difficult to enforce because we need to see, we literally need to essentially see that person lighting the fuse and igniting it. And if there's three people standing there and nobody saw anything, there's not much we can do about it. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, I do wanna just acknowledge that we have Mayor Pro Tem Salee, uh, that it needs to be elevated. And Just got read. All right, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello. Great. Yeah, I don't know. I, I was just listening. I cannot even speak or anything in the beginning. But I was here from like 15 minutes after. Oh, well, welcome. Happy you're, you, you've been able to join us here. Yes. Well, I'll jump in because Solon was truly the Wild West of the 4th of July this year and last year. Um, right now we have a council that's fairly divided and uh, right now the majority supports the fireworks. We allow them from July 1st to um, July 4th and um, without some public pressure, I don't see that changing. We do have two issues that we have to address. One, we have people lighting these fireworks off on public property, um, either the parks, um, parking lots, streets, um, and that's a concern. So we're going to have to figure it work with the sheriff's department to figure out how we're going to handle that. And two, um, we have people closing off public streets to set up these displays. And that again is an issue. If there was an emergency, uh, we needed to get a fire truck or an ambulance down those roads, these things are set up ready to light. And that would be a very big issue. So those are the two primary concerns that have been spoken about at a recent council meeting. And again, changes in Solon are really gonna come from outcry at the public at this point. Um, and, you know, as Mayor Stang said at a recent meeting, um, we certainly hope that it's, it's, it's not going to be an injury or death that, that brings that. This is Chris Taylor and Swisher. I'll just piggyback on some of what Sheriff Kunkel said, because I know he and I have spoken about it after the fact uh, offline. But um, 
you know, uh, one of the big problems is just the consistency when you're dealing with a lot of different jurisdictions within a relatively small area. Um, Cedar Rapids is half a mile away from Swisher. Shueyville's a third of a mile. I can walk 60 feet in that direction and I'm in unincorporated Johnson County. Uh, I think Swisher, like all those other places are, we have a ban saying you can't launch consumer grade fireworks without permission from council. So at least there is some consistency there, but then that puts the burden on both sheriff's deputies and members of the public in each of those places to know what the rules are in whichever place they happen to see these things happening. And I think we're also trying to be very cognizant of not being an entity that is telling neighbors to you know, call the cops on their neighbors um, for a couple of different reasons, as Sheriff Kunkel alluded to. We don't want the sort of annoyance calls to be taking attention away from medical emergencies, from uh, other higher priority calls. Um, we're also trying to be cognizant of the fact that whenever you tell residents to call the police or the sheriff's department on their neighbors, that that has a disproportionate effect um, on certain groups. So this year, we really tried to make it more of an educational component and reached out to residents who we anticipated might have concerns to let them know what our rules were what the county's rules were, what Shueyville's rules were, so that everyone at least knew when they were having conversations with their neighbors, they knew what the law said. And generally I'm fairly negative on, on social media. I think Facebook is a toxic wasteland in a lot of ways. Um, but this year we had a very active group within some of our local Facebook groups um, that was trying to spread that word and telling people, hey, we know it's fun, we know it's cool to blow stuff up, but you need to know that this is against the law. And when you do this, it's having these effects. And so we really did get some local buy-in, which I think helped, um, helped this year more than it has sometimes in the past. I, I think we're certainly feeling pressure sometimes to just prosecute every single case, um, but I think that's probably unrealistic. And the best we can do is just make it an ongoing educational effort to let people know what their, what their options are as private citizens too. Did you get some answers, John? Yes, I did. I, I think perhaps um, Mayor Lundell, I, I would be interested in the, um, the number, since you're perhaps most like Iowa City, if, if I can make that statement, um, that uh, you know the number of calls for service, uh, the number of verbal warnings, and the number of citations that Coralville issued would be of interest to me, uh, and perhaps the I would hope the council in terms of understanding. Um, how things have gone, how things went in Coralville with respect to those measures. Sure, we'll get that information sent over to Jeff and he can distribute it. Thank you. Thanks to everybody that chimed in. I'm gonna go ahead and move on. We're uh, kind of coming up on the end of our hour. I know that uh, we have another topic here and um, I know there are some folks wanted to make some community comment, which we were going to do at the end. So I'm going to try and keep us fairly short, but if you can stick around a little past 530, that may be great. But let's go ahead and move on to our next listed topic um, that was also put on by the city of Iowa City. Um, kind of get a report out from the different uh, entities on the American Rescue Plan and spending. Yeah, so this uh, was something that we put on here mainly because we wanted to ensure that the conversations are being what well, we wanted to promote, that conversations are being had um, within entities and municipalities. But we also wanted to encourage to the, to the best of everyone's ability to partner, to start having conversations about what partnership looked like 
And maybe just briefly, I know we won't have enough time for everybody to speak on this topic, but maybe I'll just ask our city manager, Jeff Cruin, just to give kind of a, a quick update of uh, some of the things that we've been doing. Sure, uh, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, real quick from the city of Iowa City, we're um, just starting our public engagement efforts. We kicked those off in early July with some online uh, surveys and have now started to, to do some more in-person uh, um, public engagement. Uh, we expect that that'll last through August and our intention is to get in front of our city council in Iowa City in September uh, with some uh, synopsis of that uh, public input and uh, kind of help them begin that process of prioritizing use of the funds that uh, we've received here. So that's that's the time frame we're working on. Thank you, Jeff. And I don't know if anyone else has uh, uh, wanted to offer anything, any other municipalities. Uh, this is Pat Hyden. Uh, Donna Brooks, are you with us? Gosh, I, had, I remember Donna had to leave at 515. Okay, okay. Um, quickly, and Lisa helped me with this. Um, we have a committee that's been meeting uh, since February, and uh, we've we've really um, got, I think, the structure and process is ready to go. We, too, are, you know, public engagement is so important. We've got an online survey. So if you haven't been online, um, just Johnson County, Iowa, Dot gov slash ARPA and fill out the survey. We will be at the fair next week and, and uh, uh, be distributing the, the surveys and, and also are planning, I think, six or seven sessions throughout the county, again, um, to, to uh, listen to the public and, and really get public input. Um, we have had conversations with um, City of Iowa City and we'll be able to collaborate on a few things and, and uh, we're looking forward to that and, and just open to, to any collaboration that, that we all think is appropriate um, moving forward. So um, lots going on behind the scenes as I know um, that's true with everyone. And, and again, focusing on that public engagement. All right, thanks. And I guess that's all we have for this item. Uh, could we please get Ray Forsyth elevated from a, an attendee to a panelist? I see in the Q&A that he had mentioned he's here. He may have something he wishes to add. Is that an elected official? He's, he's with the county uh, special projects manager. Oh, sure. He's fairly new to the team. Sure. Should be coming on now. Good afternoon, I'm Ray Forsyth. As, as they indicated, I'm the special projects manager and Allison Wells and Donna Brooks and I are staffing the leadership team with the county. A um, Couple just quick things. We've reached out to all of the municipalities in the county offering our assistance. Um, as Pat indicated, we are doing a survey. We're able to share the information from the survey by zip code, by community that they identified their partners with or participating from. So we're um, here to assist the communities as they need it, if you need it. Um, just want to make sure that all the communities know to request their funds, um, those that didn't get it directly from the treasury, which is most of our communities. And if you need assistance, we're here to help you. Thank you. You're welcome. That's the end, end of our report. Okay, um, it looks like we lost Sean. 
Um, so um, based on that being the last item of our planned agenda, and if folks can just um, stick around for a little bit so we can allow a few minutes of community comments. Um, for those who are wanting to do a community comment, please raise your hand. Um, I will identify you and you'll be given um, four minutes uh, to address the panel. Um, but since we will go over our scheduled time, we won't be able to allow for very long comments, but we're gonna try and get as many folks in as possible. And first up, I see Sarah Barron. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to address you briefly. I'm Sarah Barron. I'm the director of the Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, along with your other COVID and ARPA updates, um, deserve some mention about housing and how important it is that we keep people housed as we work to recover from the pandemic. Um, as you probably already know, the final extension of the eviction moratorium expires at the end of this month. Um, and Iowa Public Radio and other news outlets reported this week that there are 41,000 Iowans who are worried about eviction and foreclosure because of their inability to pay their bills because of the COVID pandemic. Um, here in Johnson County, we've been doing a tremendous amount of work to keep people in their homes, working with everyone in the housing sector, tenants, homeowners, realtors, um, and, um, and landlords to keep people safely housed. Um, we have partnered with the city of Iowa City and Johnson County to provide some more stopgap funding while landlords wait for um, payment to come from the Iowa Rent and Utility Assistance Program. Um, we are also continuing to help people apply for that program for the first time. And I can't say enough good things about the Coralville Public Library, the North Liberty Public Library, and Johnson County Social Services for partnering with the Affordable Housing Coalition to assist residents in applying for that aid. Um, it has not been an easy process for anyone, lots of frustration, but the good news is people are getting paid. The question still remains, will they be paid in time to prevent eviction or non-renewal of leases? Um, and so I urge you all to really um, tune into this issue. Think about if there are other opportunities to work on a local level to provide funding to keep people safely housed. Again, it's absolutely critical that people stay in their homes and stay safely housed if we're going to recover, not just health-wise, but also economically from this pandemic. Um, and so I want to thank you all for tuning into this issue um, and really leaning in to make sure it happens. I know that we are leading the state in this issue um, and still um, we're, we're gravely concerned about what the potential impact could be. Um, so uh, please reach out to the coalition if you have ideas for us or suggestions, feedback, um, and make sure that you're talking with everyone across the housing sector about how important it is. Um, you know, from the landlord's point of view, the number one thing that I can say is if they evict a resident, they will lose out on their opportunity to receive back rent through the state program. Um, and so in addition to being the right thing to do, there's also some serious economic incentive um, to work with us on um, alternatives to eviction. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Next, we have Mohammed Trehor. If I mispronounced your name, please feel free to come in and correct me. Thank you. My name is Mohammed Traore. I'm currently the chair of the City of Iowa City Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'm just here today to talk to you guys about the American Rescue Plan funds. Um, many of you have received emails from me. I do know that I sent them to every city official in Johnson County or their staff on the night of Thursday, May 27th. I didn't receive very many replies um, did get some from some of you, did have a few conversations. However, I'm just pretty disappointed with the actual movement on this. I know that there is there are some things that have been said in terms of, okay, we need to figure out how exactly we're gonna distribute the funds. We need to figure out the rules on how they can be used. And then these surveys as well, in terms of getting engagement. However, there's, to me, a lot of complaining about what has not been able to be done yet and not enough action there is the ability to go door to door to people in the community to ask them for their input, 
We can also put ads on public access television or as well to talk to more of the newspapers to get more stories about this out can go directly to the nonprofits that many uh, individuals do frequent at and get the information out there. Additionally, would like to see more collaboration between the cities and the city officials in Johnson County. For some reason, some of the cities are missing from this meeting and you guys don't have these very often. And I don't know how you're supposed to collaborate on one, the American Rescue Plan funds, if people can't even show up to this meeting as well when it comes to uh, going forward. Where exactly is the timeline on making these decisions? I'm just at a loss for words on what I've seen so far in the last several months. This bill was passed in, I believe, March, and here we are sitting on July 19th. And while there is some movement on surveys, there just isn't enough in terms of actual outreach to ensure that people that are doing things such as working two jobs or working overnight shifts or that don't know English specifically are getting the ability to answer this survey. I know that it was re-released with uh, more languages attached. However, uh, this seemed like this was spurred on by the Iowa City Catholic Worker House and them actually putting this in Spanish. So the people of your towns are the ones pushing you on this and are asking you to act a little faster. And I'm just not seeing that movement. So at this point, is it truly the voice of the people that you're here to listen to and be guided by? Or is it just the amount of time that you feel that you have to put towards this? I just think that if someone is going to be a public official and that they're going to stand for the, for the values of the people that they are supposed to preside over, then they should be putting their best interests at heart by putting in the amount of time necessary to advance the things that they truly need to get done. If that means working a few extra hours each week, then so be it. I myself still have some work to do today, but here I am in this meeting, making sure that I tell you that you are not doing enough for your constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Next we have David De La Torre. Hello, uh, my name is David De La Torre. I am the president of LULAC Council 308 which is part of the Fund Excluded Workers Coalition comprised of 16 groups in the community. Uh, we're here to tell the joint entities that the Fund Excluded Worker Coalition has been distributing a Spanish language survey about the COVID-19 pandemic and American Rescue Plan. Our coalition will continue to distribute the survey through the end of July, but I'm here to, today to present on some preliminary findings. I believe that these findings show how some of the most vulnerable members of our society have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. We know that frontline workers, immigrants, uh, previously incarcer incarcerated individuals and others were hit hard. We as a coalition urge everyone here to listen to this information because the excluded workers, immigrants and frontline workers in our community have been the backbone of our society uh, and our communities at a high cost to their families, to their health, both mental and physical and their communities. They're, they carried our cities, our county and our country forward during an unprecedented time of crisis. It is now on each of on each of us on the entities to consider taking a step towards them. 146, so a little background on the survey. Uh, there's 146 Spanish speaking immigrant workers who completed the survey from Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty, Tiffin and Lone Tree. 86% reported they do not have health insurance. 62% said they or someone in their family got sick, was hospitalized or died from COVID-19 last year. These families had endured grief and illness and loss. 76% defined themselves as essential workers. 83% said they or someone in their household lost a job or income since March 1st, 2020. 94% said that they did not receive unemployment insurance since March 1st, 2020. And 20% reported they are still unemployed. 83% of respondents reported they did not receive a stimulus check in the last year. And only 17% reported that their children received a stimulus check. They haven't had sufficient support or a break during this time. 62% of the survey respondents said they are worried about how they will pay the bills next month, the rent, utilities, food, and medicine. These are stressful situations to be in and can take a toll on mental health and health. 91% of responders said they support American Rescue Plan money being used to provide direct assistance to workers excluded from previous pandemic relief and 96% reported they support ARP investments to pay for hazard pay for essential workers. What does this all mean? Uh, these results are preliminary and the survey will continue to be filled out for, the, for at least two more weeks. 
but the pre preliminary results are clear in showing that the current system is failing and under underserving immigrant and frontline workers, excluded workers. This is why we urge entities to create an excluded worker fund that provides real relief. You have an opportunity to help people who have been hurting and are continuing to suffer even while we're emerging out of this pandemic. And the time is now to support our workers. Thank you. Thank you, David. And our last community comment will be Eric Harris. And thank you to um, all the attendees for allowing us to go over a little bit for tonight's meeting. Eric. Yes, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we hear you, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, my name is Eric Harris. Um, I am a part of the TRC Commission in Iowa City. Um, and I'm also a supporter of the fund to um, for excluded workers. Um, they need the money. Um, before there was even a pandemic, those workers that we call excluded workers were already struggling. And then when the pandemic came, it just made it worse because they wasn't eligible for certain things because of certain reasons. Um, the survey, um, like the results that I saw from the survey, you know, I know it was a survey from the city of, you know, Iowa City or from Johnson County, but the survey that I seen that was independently um, made was alarming to me because um, sometimes you have a survey and sometimes you have things, but take a walk around Iowa City and you can see, you know, just take a walk around Johnson County, just go in any place as you can see there's a lot of people that are not doing good at this point. Um, also, um, with the undocumented people, they need help. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a person that have close relations with people who are undocumented, and I know people like that. Also, people who are, who were formerly incarcerated, they are also devastated by this pandemic because they had a hard time before, you know, getting jobs when they needed jobs, and then now during the pandemic, when a whole bunch of restaurants shut down and a whole bunch of essential businesses shut down because of the pandemic. Now you have all these people trying to go back out and get jobs, which is very difficult. And also due to no fault of this county or any cities in the Johnson County area, um, the unemployment like benefits, they just kicked everybody off of them. And those people needed those funds to you know, pay maybe pass through gas bills because during the pandemic they couldn't work. So they, you know, they might not be able to pay their electricity bill or their rent and they need this money now because they don't get it they're going to get you know they need the, they need this money to pay their rent that they you know they want to pay their rent um also um the government must act now because it's like really real life things you know i know a lot of people that are going through a lot of things they you know during the pandemic maybe some of their family members were um infected with the covid-19 or maybe people that they know that died or anything like that me myself personally um i know two family members that died you know during the covid 19 plus my whole household except for me was infected with covid 19. so this is very important and this is something that you know that needs to be that needs to be listened to and needs to be explained thank you Thank you, Eric. And I do see that Chris Taylor has his hand up. Um, I'll let him make any closing comments that he had. Yeah, I just, I don't wanna take anyone else's time and I didn't wanna take time away from the, the obviously very important public comments. Um, just wanted to mention for anyone who doesn't know that uh, Iowa is sending four folks to compete in the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. And of those four, two Paralympians are going from Johnson County, uh, Aaron Kirkhoff from Solon and Jessica Himes from Swisher are going to compete in the Paralympics in August. Um, so I think we can, we can all be proud of that here in Johnson County. And that's all I've got right now. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and with that, if none of the other municipalities have anything else, I will go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.